event uh, called Gresham's Law. Um, we're here today to do many things. You'll have noticed on the invitation, it's an exhibition, it's a book signing. Um, it's also listening to Michael do some boring stuff for a while. So you, you get everything tonight, uh, the highs and the lows. Um, I'm really delighted, though, that everybody's come here today because we're seeing the end of what, at least for me, has been a, a five-year part-time project. And for certain other people, uh, probably slightly more than part-time, uh, indeed. Uh, and I have here, of course, uh, Dr. John Guy, who will be speaking later. Um, so the program this evening, as per uh, the things on your sheet, is I'll be talking for uh, about 15 to 20 minutes. We'll hand over to John Guy, and then um, the key thing is that there's book signing tonight. Book signing, book signing, book buying. You can buy a book. Uh, it can be signed. Uh, it's at the back, and it's a book. Uh, there's one for 20 quid. Um, recommended retail price is 25, uh, two for 30, and there are books at the back uh, for signing and buying. Anyway, I think I made my point. Right. Um, uh, so what I'd like to do, uh, just in the opening, is talk for a few minutes. I said to John, I would like to talk, if you didn't mind, about a particular element, which is actually, in a strange and particularly specific way, got absolutely nothing to do with Sir Thomas Gresham. That's why it's called Gresham's Law. Uh, and so I'll talk about that in a minute. But first, uh, a few words, if I might. Um, you're here at an FS Club event. Uh, I'm one of the co-chairmen of S FS Club. FS Club began uh, about 15 years ago with a friend of mine, uh, Chris Skinner, and another friend, Andy Koppel, and both of them got it going with the assistance that I might add from his end. In fact, we opened um, their Scottish and their Irish offices for them. Um, and a couple of uh, years ago, both Chris and uh, Andy said they wanted to retire, but they'd like their legacy to endure. And I said, well, it's enduring. Um, we'll, uh, we will take it on. So we've taken on FS Club, and there's a whole host of events. If you're interested in joining the club, uh, James Pitcher, James, stand up, wave your hands around. Thank you, James. And that, that's the man you can chat to him. Um, the FS Club itself uh, runs a host of events, as I said. We're doing about uh, 25 to 40 a year. Uh, something in that neighborhood, and it's very much sort of a networking thing for those of you who are in financial services. Chris Skinner uh, is still involved, and he runs a blog every day. I don't know how he does it. Uh, it's, a, it's an astonishing blog. Um, and if you sign up at FS Club, he charges you, and we charge you absolutely nothing to get a daily uh, news feed on what's going on in financial services, banking, uh, asset management, insurance. So a lot going on there. The teaming of the two clubs uh, with Long Finance has been uh, really quite good. Long Finance has tended, uh, in its long view of the world, to be doing sort of more considered reports, longer term reports. You know, uh, we've been issuing a report about every month or two months on various subjects in financial services for you know, we'll getting on as well for 15 years. So the two clubs together uh, really give you quite a bit of fun. Um, in terms of where we're headed, uh, we've got tons of research on this site, and you can go and have a look at it. But that's not what we're here to chat about tonight. So ads over, uh, HMRC, anybody here from HMRC? Great work, you know. I can have justify this evening. Great, super. Now you have in your pockets a coin. I hope all of you picked up a coin. Uh, and uh, we're going to divide this into two bits. We're here to not talk about Thomas Gresham in the first half. and here to talk totally about Thomas Gresham in the second half. Uh, and we have this coin minted at the end. Uh, this year, and this coin is a commemorative coin because it's his 500th year, the quincentenary of his birth. Now, I, I titled this section of this evening, uh, Gresham's Law, the full Montebank. You'll all remember, of course, what a Montebank is, so one, one might question this, but is he really a charlatan? John will have uh, many views on his moral fiber, character, values, and virtue, um, but I'm going to talk about just one element of it. Now, Gresham himself uh, did a number of things, which I will cover. Um, he was a man. He was very driven. He had a plan. Uh, and in fact, in terms of buying a Panama, those of you who remember the old joke, a man, a plan, a canal. Um, you know, this, this was a key. Uh, and in fact, he created the first shopping exchange. He created, uh, the, he brought over from the low countries the idea of a course. And he also arguably uh, created the first big fraction of reserve banking, which a number of people haven't really got into, but uh, we'll talk about that. And you'll see him all over the city, and John will be chatting about him, his legacy, the controversy about him. But I'm here to talk about just one specific aspect that makes HMRC happy. 
and that's about the FS Club and Gresham's Law. So you'll remember Gresham's Law. Well, Gresham's Law is frequently stated as good money drives out bad. Um, it's thus stated in Cyclopedia Britannica, and when, in fact, we opened the exhibition, Peter, where are you? So Peter, Peter Ross over there, very back here. Peter, stand up and give a wave. Uh, Peter is in charge of this entire facility, so he can answer all the questions you'd like uh, about the Guildhall Library. But Peter very kindly took the text that I wrote, uh, sent it out, and then immediately got a slew of, it's not good money drives out bad, it's bad money drives out good. Don't you know what you're talking about? Well, perhaps. Now, this is the Encyclopedia Britannica entry, uh, but this entry is about 160 years old, uh, and in fact, it's dead wrong. In fact, it's almost the other way around. It's good money drives out bad. So if you look very carefully on the coins that you've been handed, You'll see on one side it says, good money drives out bad, and on the other side it says, bad money drives out good. Um, so at the end of my 15 minutes, you can decide which way you would like to express Gresham's Law, and we'll leave it to you. So this is the, uh, the entry uh, in the Britannica. So what are the points I'd like to make before we get into the basics of it? Well, the first thing is, uh, the law itself predates Aristophanes, which I think kind of sort of scotches Gresham's 1519 claim, if he'd done it in his cradle uh, completely, uh, as you might say. I think the second thing is that it, it is falsely attributed to him, but why? We'll come on to that. And it's also incorrectly expressed, as I've already um, foreshadowed. So let's have a quick look at some of the background. Well, the first thing is that the first expression of Gresham's law uh, that we can find in the historical record is Theognis, uh, who's a dramatist from the uh, 6th century BC, who actually writes up there, he's a, he's a poet, and he writes up there, nor will, will anyone take in exchange worse when better is to be had. So he's um, actually not talking about uh, bad money driving out good, he's talking about good money driving out bad. I would rather have good coin than bad coin. Aristophanes, um, perhaps most memorably, if you really want to dig into this, um, a lot of people will say when they try and scotch uh, Gresham, coining Gresham's law, they'll focus on Aristophanes. Uh, and in the frogs, uh, there is this bit that the full body coins that are the pride of Athens are never used while the mean brass coins pass hand to hand. Um, and this is the idea that because they had to use the brass coins, people would hold on uh, to the very, very good coins. So here the bad money is driving out the good. But the important bit is, this is during the time of the Peloponnesian War, and so the government had mandated that you had to take these cheap brass coins. This will come up in a minute as we close. But So is it bad money drives out good, or good money uh, drives out bad? Now, as a bit of a, um, a set piece here today, I, in fact, have a Greek drachma. Uh, this is, those of you who'd like to come up and take it or be photographed, it, where's Emad hiding? Emad, where are you? There's Emad. You, you were thrilled when we had this in February, weren't you, in uh, Budapest? Um, but this is actually a, a Greek coin. One of the astonishing things about the drachma um, is that Alexander is conquering uh, vast areas, and he's one of the first people to work out, believe it or not, that money is an important bit of conquering. He's able to pay his troops, because everywhere he invades, he finds silver. He melts the silver down, and with a tiny little die and a stamp sitting in his saddlebag, effectively, or his chariot, he's actually able to mint money and pay his troops. And the hoplites, the, the Greek warriors, were paid one drachma a day. One of the rather interesting uh, elements of the drachma is that the weight of silver in the drachma, this drachma is about 225 to 275 pounds. I didn't look the price off this morning. Um, and that's about what we pay a British body today. So <laughs> over 2,300 years, we still pay them the same amount per day. So that's, that's kind of intriguing. Uh, anyway, come up and see me afterwards. So we, uh, we now see a law which everybody understood, which is that if I have money, and in particular the government says, I have to accept this money, come what may, I suddenly <coughs> hoard the good stuff, and I start spending the bad stuff, as, as, as I think you would almost immediately agree. Um, now, the other thing is this continues through the ages. Uh, we have, of course, uh, petitions, believe it or not, to Edward uh, II, or sorry, Edward III and Richard II, which indicate that the population of England understood this in the 1300s, and that's there. 
Uh, probably the most notable proponent of this is Nicholas Eresme, who in the uh, 14th century is talking about this law. Um, and he's doing it under an interesting uh, situation. There was something like, what was it, John, 86 three coinages under Eresme? Uh, Yeah. So Charles V, yes. Yeah. So you're seeing a, a huge amount of rebasement in that period. Uh, and then, of course, we have John Hales, uh, quite interesting, who dies in 1571, who again expresses it. So this is not a particularly unusual law. People understand the idea that if I force people to trade good coin and bad coinage, they'll hoard the good coinage, and the bad coin will be the stuff that they, that they try and spend. Um, and in fact, uh, John will be covering this. This is the man himself, uh, Sir Thomas, and he expresses this in here in his, uh, his, his rather, uh, how did you phrase it the other day, his sort of phonetic English um, in, in, in quite a good way. So what happened? Well, actually, the interesting thing is uh, the last sort of major hagiography of Gresham was uh, <coughs> Bergen in 1839. And we suddenly find uh, Henry Dunning MacLeod. Um, I, I sort of see him as this kind of uh, crazy Scot who's trying to uh, express the idea that everything to do with economics was invented in Britain. So he, he blows up kind of uh, Adam Smith. He blows up Ricard. He's, he's really talking. And he himself, uh, to be fair, makes some good contributions in the area of uh, credit and money. Um, but he, he expresses in here this whole bit he says here, in, 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 in two sorts of coins are current in the same nation, blah, blah, blah. And then he ends with, this law is of such fundamental importance in political economy that good and bad coin cannot circulate together, but the bad coin will drive out the good. And this is what Britannica picks up. And of course, this leads to this very odd expression that bad money drives out good is the expression of Gresham's law. That's what we've all learned in school. That's what all the things repeat and repeat and repeat. But actually, um, it's not true. So what is right? Well, um, the, Robert Mundell, who wins the Nobel Prize in 99, wrote a beautiful piece called Uses and Abuses of Gresham's Law in Monetary History. And he points out that uh, all of these things uh, have been going back and forth and back and forth. Uh, but he points out broadly that uh, I think two things I'd like to express. I mean, the first is that the application of money is straightforward and you know of two types of payments payment <coughs> pay with that which involves the least sacrifice and i think we all know that just think to yourself i've got two bits i know one is more valuable than the other which am i going to offer in payment first i'm going to offer the cheaper one aren't i we all would you know, don't, don't think nobly you're, you're going to offer the cheaper one without question i've got two things and this individual in front of me seems to think they're both about the same, you can have the one that I think is cheaper. That is what you would naturally do. So you pay with the bad and you keep the good. But that implies that the person opposite you in some way has no idea of this. And the only reason that they might feel like that is if they're forced to accept it. So when kings or queens decide that you have to take their money uh, in equal measure to good money, you will in fact spend the bad they will have to take the bad and you will keep the good, so that leaves out the hoarding. Even more simply, uh, uh, and as John said, uh, I think on Thursday night, probably the best expression is, um, if you wish to start with bad money, bad money drives out good if they exchange for the same price. So, uh, so it's really good money drives out bad, but bad money drives out good if they're forced to exchange for the same price. So, please. Help me fix a 160-year-old error, okay? Yeah, I mean, I think over the 2,600 years this law has been around, we can fix it. It's only 160 years of uh, misrepresentation. We can fix it ourselves. So I send you all out charged uh, to, to, to do that on Gresham's 500th year. And he doesn't even care because it wasn't his law in the first place. <laughs> so everybody's happy. So good money drives out bad, but bad money drives out good if they're forced to exchange for the same price. And I'm delighted to say uh, that we, in fact, have given you a little aid memoir so that you can hold this coin forth and show your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, I don't want to presume how old we all are, uh, and explain to them what's going on in real life.
Right. Well, I am the warm-up act. Uh, you look very cold, so I'll leave you to clap <laughs> later. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but we're here today to talk about uh, John Guy and the book. Now, I noticed many of you called the exhibition. Uh, we'll be having a reception here, uh, well, sorry, upstairs later. You can also catch the exhibition and catch bits of it. Uh, Peter has pulled out a tremendous amount of materials uh, from the Guildhall Library, from Hook, uh, etc. So it's really, it's really worth watching a little gem of a small exhibition. Uh, but John uh, was commissioned by us uh, at Gresham College and the City of London Corporation. Uh, and the Mercers, the three entities came together and asked John four years ago, 2015, four years ago, would he mind writing a book for us? And he said, no, I don't mind, as long as it pays, you know, good money drives out, good, good writing, I think that's, that's uh, And he gave a brilliant uh, lecture on Thursday evening, so a lot of the detail will be in that, and you can watch it. But he's very kindly decided to come here to FS Club to um, What's that? What's at the back there? Books. Oh, books, 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 yes. As long as you, you ask him to sign books uh, and, and buy them. So I'm going to hand over to John, who's got a, a lot to say uh, about Sir Thomas Gresham. And a lot of this, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we saw uh, Bergen's book in 1839. And there have been a few little odds and sods, but in all honesty, there really hasn't been a biography uh, of Gresham ever done properly. Uh, in 500 years, and yet I, I think you know there's been a lot of talk about Hilary Mantel and Wolf Hall and Thomas Cromwell and the new biography of Cromwell, but in many ways Gresham to me is more interesting because he's trading through the same period, uh, making and as John will explain, losing a lot of money, um, but he keeps his head uh, and he sets up the basis in many ways for. London, uh, really, in the 16th century and its subsequent rise uh, through the last four. So, John, over to you. Thank you. essentially part of 30 Gresham Street, of course then it was called Cattle Ken Street. It was renamed after Gresham, but not till 1844, but two weeks before Queen Victoria opened the new uh, Third Royal Exchange. Uh, the house um, is in the same road as Thomas More was born in 1478. Uh, I'm not sure that Thomas More was born where the blue plaque is. It, we don't really know where he was born in, in Rock Street, but we know that Gresham was born uh, in um, uh, on the opposite side of the top because in fact there's a rude description of the house somewhere and that it had a back door leading onto what was then Cattle Kent Chemistry. Okay, um, he um, was educated in Cambridge at Goggle Hall. We know this because um, it was always rumoured but the um, indentures for audit, that's essentially the records of students paying their fees after they matriculated. Um, the college, um, shall we say, misplaced them uh, for a century. Uh, I had to give some job to talk my way in, and then I had to pull a bit of plow to um, to, uh, to get in, and they let me rummage, and I found it in 20 minutes, which I think was actually a good fortune, but it's definitely there. So he went to Keys, uh, as it's now called, or Gondel Hall, then in the age of 11, and that was a college in Cambridge that did take um, young boys at that age, so it was really it was sort of rather like going, I, I suppose, to the sort of... Um, St. Paul's School then, where he sort of started out, was really more of an ABC and a sort of preparatory school. But it was certainly, um, it's a more interesting idea than going, shall we say, to Eton. Uh, uh, but, um, of course, one suspects that because Thomas More um, had, in fact, um, uh, had hired um, William Goddell, who was one of the tutors at, at, um, at Goddell Hall, to teach his daughters, and they lived across the street. Surprise, surprise, when Gresham gets to Gondola Hall, he's taught by William Gondola, so I think there's a connection there. Uh, I mention more because really there are three, I mean I've been doing this game of Tudor history for, I mean I've owned up to 30 years, but it's probably more, just over 40. Uh, and uh, there are three really revolutionary people in that century. One is Thomas More, who wrote Utopia. The other one is Thomas Cromwell, who was Henry VIII's enforcer, the third is Thomas Gresham. Uh, and it's actually true, what might is actually true, Gresham is virtually unknown, and, and I'll come to why I think he's important. Um, one of the reasons why he's important 
uh, is that he's the first truly, if you like, um, almost um, sort of wizard of global finance. Uh, he is the first person to actually act not just as a merchant banker, because many, many, I mean, most um, successful merchants have a line in banking. This is the first person that I know of anywhere in Europe who understood or created the pathway for what it was to be um, not just a government banker, but actually to get some sort of grip on what we call monetary policy. Uh, you know, exactly, you know, not just deals, but actually you know, what the significance of this meant for the economy of the country and the coinage and all of those things, but I'll come to that a little bit, a little bit later. Um, he was also, I think, the first person in Europe to understand, uh, at least that I was able to find, that um, markets, uh, and um, particularly foreign exchange markets, um, that could hold sovereign nations uh, and monarchs to ransom as much as the reverse. And of course he could have only understood that because Elizabeth's England, uh, where he was actually working the longest, uh, was in fact a fledgling Protestant state and extremely vulnerable, surrounded as it were you know, by um, Catholic powers in France um, and of course Spain, and of course Spain, uh, uh, after the death of Charles V, was taken over um, to a, well, Spain already had the Netherlands in the sense that the Gungian lands passed for Spain with the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. But the point about that is that Charles V ruled the Netherlands on essentially the basis of a series of free cities maintaining the liberties of the various cities, whereas Philip II ruled them as a sort of outpost of the Spanish Empire, introducing the Inquisition and all sorts of things um, which were detrimental really in the long run to, to Antwerp. Uh, and we should also just say very just quickly that London then was effectively a suburb of Antwerp from the trading and economic point of view. Antwerp was the main transit port, not Calais. Uh, the bulk of English exports, uh, Thomas Gresham exported broadcloth, curses, curses were just smaller broadcloth, broadcloths were unfinished uh, cloths and you export them, they're very large, you export them in the bale. Uh, tin, lead, uh, those were the main wove which was used for cheap blue dye. Uh, and of course, cloths were finished in, in, <coughs> in, 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 the, in the Netherlands and then sent along you know, the trade routes to Italy, uh, into Germany, out to the Baltic States, uh, even as far as Spain. Um, um, uh, and luxury goods, of course, came the other way. Antwerp's terribly important for a number of reasons. Uh, it's, the set, it's the center that the Portuguese have given the monopoly of the, um, uh, the spice and pepper trade, too. Uh, it, it is populated by um, Spaniards, Italians, Germans, Portuguese, um, even um, uh, Turks, the Greeks, Armenians, just about everybody is, is congregating <laughs> there. The guilds, um, the livery companies, if you like, don't have that, the power to impose um, limits on who can trade in a particular craft, so anyone can set up a shop, shop there, uh, all of those things, but perhaps most of all, especially in the context here. Uh, the Emperor Charles V in 1540 had said that um, in, the Spanish, in, the, in the Netherlands, but particularly in Antwerp, commercial credit was legal. That's revolutionary because in the Middle Ages, of course, um, basically credit and charging interest was usually a <coughs> crime against the Sicilians, uh, considered to be a crime in the church. I mean, <coughs> usually it was still technically a crime until 1571 and even after 1571, the rate of interest, uh, the maximum rate of interest on that was 10 was 10 was 10 was 10 percent. So Antwerp really had something going for it. That of course changed with, um, in terms of um, the geopolitics of the 16th century. Uh, and as it changed, because this is just the last point I want to make about the sort of long-term significance of Gresham, is that in the course of the, the work that he did, in particular, um, Henry VIII, who debased the coinage to pay for his last wars in France, had, had effectively um, reduced the coinage by you know, at least a third, heading, heading downwards. And then, of course, the next regime, that of the young Edward VI, um, they also needed money for the Scottish campaign and war in France, repeated it. Uh, and uh, although um, a, a recoinage had been begun selectively uh, with Mary I um, in Mary, we call her Mary Tudor. Uh, in, in, that, in that rate, which had only encompassed a, a, a very small proportion of the currency, so that that money out there was still very, very, very extensive. And Gresham knew that not only was it, it was inadvisable as conditions in Europe were worsening, 
that, um, that England should be a sort of like hostage, really, because it's got sovereign debt uh, out of the country, especially in a sovereign party, new to try and switch that back to London and borrow and repay in sterling. Um, but he also, of course, knew that the coinage had to be, be restored. But that's a sort of by way of introduction. Now we get to, I think, to the interesting bit because we get to see the pics. Uh, this is a picture that, a, a portrait that Gresham commissioned. I have to tell you, it's in, really in 1545. It's, there's a reason why it says 1544. This, and this solves the whole question. You've already done the arithmetic, you can realize that if you look at that, you think he was born in 1580, you would be wrong. Uh, he, he had this commissioned uh, really um, within weeks of being admitted to the livery of the Mercer's Company. Now that doesn't, I mean, you know better than I do because you're city people, that that doesn't just mean being a freeman. The distinction, of course, that having the livery was that you could trade on your own account, you could open shops, you could take, you could take apprentices, you could run a business, you could have a merchant's mark, which he has here, uh, and of course, uh, he is at this point um, uh, uh, beginning to trade independently uh, in, um, in, in Antwerp and, and London. He's also just got married recently, hence the, the AG, uh, love servant of AG for Anne Fernley, and the woman he married. She'd been married before uh, to uh, William Reed, a very rich mercer, who had died relatively young. Uh, Anne Fernley had all the money. Uh, Thomas Gresham married her, and that's how he got his working capital. We begin to begin, we will come back to uh, and for the impression because she <coughs> has a higher attitude, she is a higher attitude. Fantastic character. But here we have this, this, this portrait, which uh, it, Gresham was admitted to the Liberty on the 17th of December 1544. Uh, and I know this because it's in it was an elected entry in the Mercer's Act of Court. And it's actually crucial because. You know, I mean, even if he'd gone straight down to Heathrow and got on the first plane, uh, you know, to Antwerp or Brussels or whatever, he'd have had a lot of difficulty commissioning and collecting this portrait by the end of 1544. This portrait had <coughs> been finished in 1545. There's another way of looking at this, uh, which um, actually I chose not to make much of it, didn't give anything in the book. Uh, uh, remember that in, in you still know that uh, in this country the 6th of April is a crucial day for your you know, financial affairs. Um, not the 1st you know, of January. That, of course, is because Lady Day was the, way, was the date which the actual year date changed. The, the year date changed not on the 1st of January. That You gave your New Year's gifts on the 1st of January, but 1501 know, became 1502 on Lady Day, which was the 25th of March. Now, in Antwerp, in the, in the Netherlands, it was Easter. The trouble with that is it's not wholly reliable, because I have found documents where it did change in January, it is <coughs> cosmotically. Uh, but so I rely on the fact that there is no way that he could have got to Antwerp, commissioned and collected that painting in 1544. 1544 is on it because that is the date when he got his merchant's mark. It's a symbolic date. It was the symbolic date when he gets his merchant's mark. It's the symbolic date when he's allowed to trade on his own account. Uh, it's the symbolic date when he gets going on his, on his, on, on his business. Uh, and it's the date of his marriage. However, if you're an art historian, the absolutely crucial thing about that painting is, of course, that it's a full length. Because this guy is also something of an art connoisseur. Uh, in the sense that at least he knows how to commission a good picture, because that is the first full-length painting of any non-royal Englishman or English woman that is known. And that is why it's so often exhibited in the National Portrait Gallery, and it so often appears in um, guides and um, you know, descriptions of <coughs> citizen uh, portraits and, 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 so, and, and so on. So here we go, we've got the full caboodle 26, because of course he is 26 when he's finished. 1544 is the symbolic date. A.G. Love Servant of A. This is also quite interesting because the question is, normally these marriage portraits, insofar as it is a marriage portrait, would dictate where's, where's the wife? Well, the answer is there never was one. And I know this. Because when this, um, you also wonder whether all that stuff at the side was the sort of the product of some sort of botched restoration. No, it isn't. Because when I went in, I 
this when the nurses come and lend this picture to the um, National Portrait Gallery <coughs> a couple of years ago. Uh, Charlotte Bond, the curator of the um, Institute of Strip Painting, and I went over it with a microscope and looked at it in great detail. It was also described by George Bertieu in 1731 uh, when he saw it. Um, George Bertieu was a really famous artist, art historian, the first great systematic artist who went around the country looking at everybody's pictures uh, and, and wrote them up. It looked exactly like that. It also can't be part of the dictique because in Tudor dictiques, it was absolutely standard that the man stood in the position of power with the woman on the left. You put them all there, all like that. There is no way that there could be a woman on the left here because expression is facing the wrong way. And also, there's a shadow. The shadow and, and the skull, these are memento mori. This is a Netherlandish artist trick to remind us that along with great prosperity, also comes death, uh, possibly very sudden, and one must prepare for the, for the next world. Uh, I also do wonder whether I didn't put it in the book. Love, serve, and obey is not exactly um, the. Um, Correct translation of the serum rite of the marriage service, which should be love, cherish, and obey. Uh, certainly, is translated by Cranmer, but, but, but I tell you, I have to tell you for this, you'll probably have to read the book. Uh, that um, uh, Thomas Gresham's relationship with Anne Furby was decidedly troubled throughout their entire life. I, I'll allude a little bit to that, but um, on the whole, I think he, that, that on, on the occasion of the Queen's centenary, he, he deserves to be remembered for the very considerable, remarkable revolutionary achievements he had uh, as. Um, <coughs> Okay, well, uh, he's, he got going, really, after 1544, uh, 45, he got going, uh, basically, as a merchant. This is, this is before he is involved in, uh, in, in government work. The first bit of government work that he got was um, really because his uncle, to whom he grew originally apprenticed, his uncle, Sir John Gresham, had been asked by uh, the King Henry VIII Privy Council how the Dickens he was going to shift illicitly to smuggle against the statutes in the um, um, in the Netherlands uh, a ton of coin from Antwerp uh, to Calais in order to pay uh, the mercenaries that Henry VIII had employed for the siege of Boulogne. Uh, and um, Sir John Gresham said, "Well, I'm not going to do it, but I know a man who can." Uh, and of course, it was Thomas Gresham, his his, his 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 nephew. That's how he got his first taste of working uh, for the government. He also encountered the difficulty of getting paid uh, after he'd done the, done the business. That was part of the, part of the course. But this, this um, he, you see the merchant's mark, the point it doesn't seem to be working, but you can just see here the merchant's mark here, up in places that exactly is the same as in the, in the, in the, in the, in the painting. Uh, and um, this turned up in an auction in Dis in 1952, and the merchant's company bought it for 800 pounds. Uh, it's got 6,572 entries. Uh, and it, it, <coughs> the book is kept in, it's the first known example of, of double accounting known in uh, the British Isles. Uh, it's modelled, it's clearly modelled on um, Luca Pacioli's uh, guidebook to uh, double accounting, which was 1490s, but although Gresham did read Italian, he read French, Flemish, Italian, <coughs> Spanish, uh, and um, he seems to be pretty fluent in German. Uh, it's based on um, the um, French translation, which was flying around in Antwerp in the in the 15, 15, 1540s. The interesting thing is that actually, um, and not me, um, accounting historians armed with laptops uh, have looked at this, uh, and of course they have discovered that although double accounting on the Pacioli system is supposed to enable you to work out your professional uh, spending and all, the time you earn, and to actually work out your profit and loss. Gresham could never do this. Uh, he did. He had a couple of attempts. They didn't get very far. And the reason was that he mixed up his personal spending with his professional spending rather shamelessly. Um, and of course, what I mean, uh, accounts are rather unpromising sources for working out family relations. But I had a bit of a shot of this, and you will discover that Gresham, where his family was concerned, that this, this is the first signal that he's he's not just pretty um, trying, He's not. He's not just sort of almost disturbingly transactional. Uh, whether women of his family, if any family members are concerned, he's also a bit of a control freak because nothing moves in that household without, nothing is spent in that household without going through the camp. So, you know, um, the butcher's bill, you know, whatever it is, and Fernley's uh, and Gresham's, uh, his wife's expen personal expenditure, they go through the, go through the books. Uh, it wasn't all, um, it wasn't all work. 
Um, they had a bit of fun at Christmas, and um, I just did pop this in the book. Uh, they um, they had some sort of Gresham had some sort of game uh, with paper notes, which one would love to think was a precursor of Monopoly. <laughs> uh, but as I've said, Antwerp Antwerp is the much, is, is the is really the metropolis, the commercial metropolis here, uh, and um, Gresham. At first, he 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 uh, he didn't own his own house there. Uh, at first, um, he uh, basically, um, um, should we say, he um, sort of um, rented from um, one of his merchant, one of his merchant, one of his merchant friends. I think it was a sort of cuckoo in the nest for a little while. Well. He did later buy uh, uh, his own property, uh, and one of his houses. He had a number of houses in Antwerp, and one of them is um, uh, a number forty-three of the land you start. Uh, where um, um, I actually took out the photo because I had too many images in this, but it was uh, to take the photo, it's rather a tall um, structure, and this is where I um, had a sort of bit of an argument with the passing tram, having stepped back onto the tram tracks, so it's mm -hmm. still here, but it was a close run thing. Um, but Antwerp, uh, of course, the great virtue of Antwerp was not just that it was a free city, but the shell goes right up to the city. Uh, there were also, uh, there was also a crane and you could use the crane, you could just use the crane there, which was also terribly important. You could load and unload relatively freely. Relatively, relatively, relatively uh, but of course, Gresham's spiritual home was always the, the bourse, the equivalent of the exchange. And this is the new bourse at Antwerp. Uh, it was opened um, in sort of 15, 20 years just before Gresham was at his uh, uh, Of course, it's a different of what would become the new exchange. Uh, and not only did the merchants congregate in the courtyard, uh, but of course on the first floor all the way around was Europe's first shopping mall. Of course the Royal Exchange, the first Royal Exchange also had a shopping mall on the first, on, on the first floor. Um, if he was smart, and possibly Gresham was, although we don't have any evidence of his art purchases other than his own portraits, if he was smart, he would go up there and you would buy a virgin child by painting this Metzies for a fiver, uh, or a similar artist. Thomas More, I have to say, when he was in Antwerp on the mission, on which um, shortly after which he began to write Utopia, did do that. He went up and he got one. Uh, he complained about the price, uh, but I think it was a good deal. Unfortunately, um, if you get your head chopped off by Henry VIII, you also have all your property confiscated. So uh, that um, basically um, went uh, to a different to a different place. But that is a remarkable, um, uh, that's a remarkable, a remarkable image. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, uh, that is, um, that's where it was all happening. I mean, this was not just any old exchange. This was really the premier. Lyon had a, 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 a pretty lively exchange. Seville increasingly because of the Spanish treasure ships arriving in Seville uh, every year, really coming through the Straits of Cuba. Seville became a, a significant in the, in the heyday of Gresham, really from the 40s to the late 60s, uh, Antwerp is the, the place. Okay, so Gresham is a trader, uh, but um, uh, in, um, after Henry VIII's death, uh, in the reign of the young Edward VI, of course, where, where the, the politicos were in, in, in charge and, uh, and, and running, the, running, run, running the country, uh, there were a couple of rather disastrous appointments as the government uh, agent. Uh, this isn't really a systematic government bank of a, a government agent, a government factory it's called in, in Antwerp. And uh, it's essentially they fouled up. And Gresham decides this is his moment and he makes a pitch. Uh, and the, really the second, he doesn't call himself Lord Protector because Somerset had got a bad reputation doing that, but the Duke of, the Duke, the Duke of Somerset um, being more protected first, he was Edward VI's uncle, but, but when he was basically sidelined in, in, a, in, in a palace coup and, and the Duke of John Duffy, Duke of Northumberland, uh, came in, uh, as I say, he didn't call himself Lord Protector, but to all intents and purposes, that is what he was, that is what he was doing. Uh, the Duke of Northumberland, who rather like Gresham, was a little practical chap, uh, no theory, very poor on small talk, not a great communicator, but a man of action. He organised a, what I think today we call a beauty contest, uh, where um, you know basically the London's top um, financial people, merchants, uh, bankers came and did their pitch, and Gresham got the job. He got the job. 
uh, and um, uh, uh, Mary, when Mary came in, 1553, remember she's a staunch Catholic, she then in 1554, she marries Philip of Spain, something for a in, in a minute and turns into advantage. When Mary comes in, no, sorry, only a Catholic can be the government banker, so Gresham is out. Until, of course, uh, the, uh, the, the candidate who's Christopher Dornsey fouls up, makes uh, a couple of catastrophic deals, enabling Brexley Gresham to come back in. Uh, and indeed, um, he works very happily with Mary throughout uh, the reign. This also tells us something about Thomas Gresham, because Thomas Gresham, you will have to work extremely hard to find any expression anywhere of his religious opinions or his spiritual views. Eventually, when right when we get to the end, when he's really totally secure in Elizabeth's reign, when he's you know he's um, on the best of terms with Elizabeth's chief minister William Cecil and uh, her, um, her, 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 her leading favourite um, Robert Dudley, or Robert Dudley, her Lester, he will finally come out a little bit out of the woodwork, uh, and in fact. Um, the best indicator of obvious religious opinions is in the church warden's account of St. Helen's Bishop's Gate, where you can see him being the largest contributor uh, to the fund to employ what they called a lecturer to preach sermons in the, in the parish church. Remember that then the, many of the clergy couldn't preach the sort of sermons that more advanced Protestants or those with Calvinists and Sympathists wanted, so they paid a lecturer. Uh, they were called Puritan lecturers who basically gave a sermon after the main service and Gresham was a contributor to that. And so almost certainly, uh, almost certainly, um, he, he, he developed a, a, a more, if you like, Calvinist, more reformed line of, um, of, of <coughs> spirituality. But you will have to look very hard to actually find any statement by him. Something again, I, I missed off the slide again because there you know, are there's, there's just too many. Uh, a, a intriguing thing about him is that when he was quite young still, and he'd just come back from Paris where he'd been sent down to learn uh, French uh, by, his, by, his, by his father, Richard Gresham, uh, he was given the job while Richard Gresham was Lord Mayor, 1537 to 8, of accompanying a, a group of French noble women, among one of whom was a woman called Madame de Montreuil that Henry VIII thought he might marry. It was one she was on his sort of short list of people that he might marry. Uh, after the death of James Seymour. Uh, and Gresham, Thomas Gresham was given the job of his, escorting this party of women back down towards um, Canterbury and Dover to take their ship. Uh, and they had to wait for him <coughs> to come from somewhere else to, to, to be a farewell. So he killed time by taking them to see the shrine of Thomas David in Canterbury, which was one of the great glories of the Middle Ages. I mean, the most celebrated uh, shrine of any, any, any Catholic saint, uh, certainly in Northern, Northern Europe. Uh, and he was one of the last people alive ever to see it because Henry VIII knocked it down just a few weeks later and just destroyed it. And you know, although Gresham wrote, um, for, I think it's 300 and 350 letters and wrote 125 letters to him. And in more than 25 of these letters, he described his earlier experiences. Not once did he mention being one of the last people alive to see Thomas Beckett's uh, <coughs> But in these two reigns, um, although Gresham's has gone down in history, and indeed the title of my book, uh, as, it, as, 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 as Elizabeth Banker. He, his, two of his greatest successes were actually in these reigns, because in these reigns, Gresham had cultivated his art of being, you know, if you like, the master dealer. And in debt, as I said at the outset, had, 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 had increased quite dramatically, particularly under Edward. Uh, and what he was able to do was by clever wheeling and dealing at a time when the price of silver was fluctuating quite wildly on the exchanges and interest rates were coming down, uh, he was able to reduce the government's total debt by 50% twice, once at the end of Edward's reign and once at the end of Mary's reign, to do it in between 9 and 20 months, which was you know, a phenomenal, phenomenal achievement. Uh, his third great achievement, which I'll come to later was the recoinage of 1562 to 61. But although you know he's he's through my title he's gone down essentially as a Elizabeth banker, I mean, we shouldn't write off these earlier years because these were also the years in which he was in fact um, um, if you like able, he had the most opportunity, he had the most um, success really simply as the dealer because the others hadn't learned how to do it. Now do you want to know how he did it? He was the first person 
to realise that what you needed to, to, like, to try and beat the market, which could of course only be done for certain times since other people got the trick, was to establish what probably you would call a stability, a stabilisation or equalisation fund. He wanted to float and he got Edward's government to send him £1,200 a week. That's probably at the very least £1.2 million a week. And they didn't have any money but they sent it so that he could send 15, even 100 of his mates, servants secretly into the market to buy or sell small amounts between 50 and £200. You've got to multiply by at least 1,000 to get any sort of conceptualisation of the numbers. To do that immediately before he did a much bigger deal and he could find it worked in those reigns. In early Elizabeth's reign, he wrote to the Chief Minister, uh, and said, so you know what, they all don't have to do this, this isn't going to work anymore. Uh, that he, you know, he would have to do things like that. Although he was still doing it throughout his, throughout his career, throughout his, his career to a greater extent. Of course, uh, after a little while, the government didn't have any money at, 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 at Edward's uh, reign. In Edward's reign, towards the end of the reign, they literally went on progress. That's around the long summer tour around the country because the creditors were banging on the door and they had no money. So they just basically closed the doors and you know, disappeared until some more tax revenues came in. And, and Gresham's float was stopped there. <coughs> he did what probably no one could do today. He conspired with the government to basically extort money from the merchants. Uh, before, it, 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 in effect, they had to give him for three months interest free loans, paying in, paid in Antwerp in Flemish pounds at predatory rates fixed by him, which were later to be repaid in London at even more predatory rates the other way around. Uh, uh, and if they didn't do it, uh, the government wouldn't let their ships sail, uh, or, and they would, then they would be forced into bankruptcy. You know, so this was, um, you know, I mean, there was a big row about this, and Russia was accused of being a you know, gamekeeper, a sort of poacher who turned into some sort of gamekeeper, and he was like, like a criminal. There was a big family row with his uncle about this. But I mean, so, you know, they, they, were, they, were, they were pretty ruthless about, about, about all this. But that's how he did it. He did it he said, initially by playing the market. Now, when Elizabeth comes in, uh, Gresham thinks, okay, um, the, you know, this should be good for me, and the, uh, probably, probably by then, uh, he's chummed up almost certainly with Elizabeth's chief minister, uh, William Cecil. To, um, a little bit later, he chums up with Robert Dudley. Um, but um, initially, he thinks that Elizabeth is going to be a little bit of a pushover, but he has to get there first. She's only 25, she's an experienced, she doesn't know anything about money. Uh, and um, but he knows uh, that he needs to be in first, you know, as it is with, I'm sure everyone is now sort of in um, the Conservative Party sort of you know, running around to sort of get in first with whoever they think he's going to win this, uh, win this, win this contest, win the you know, that's happening. And sort of miraculously, in some spectacular sort of theatrical act of genius, uh, Gresham was able to get wind that Mary Tudor was going to pop her clogs. He probably needed about three days at least to, to know that. Uh, and to race back uh, to London, he, he rode in um, and mud spattered into the court at Hatfield House, where Elizabeth was either just beginning or just finishing uh, the first Privy Council uh, of, of the reign. He knelt before her, kissed her hand, uh, pledged his service to her, and she reappointed him as the government banker. Uh, and she at that time said that she would, was probably she'd be prompted by Cecil here. That she would listen to him, she would always keep one ear stopped. That means you know, basically one ear open, really, to, uh, to listen to him. The other stops if she was only listening to him, to hear him. And she would reward him as well, at least as well, his services as Edward and, and, and Mary had done. And I have to say that Edward, which really means the Duke of Northumberland, and Mary had rewarded Gresham extremely well. He had done extremely well on the land front. He got incredibly valuable grants of land from those two. In Edward's case, he just picked in uh, the last minute before you know, the curtain came down because he got his grant awarded five days before Edward died. I think the letters happened were issued on the day before Edward died. Uh, of course, one of the things that with Gresham, uh, I think probably his biggest disappointment was to discover that this woman was rather steely. She was also a terrible snob. Uh, and uh, she did not like being, as Gresham thought he could do, after all, he had himself painted in 1545 as a merchant prince, in waiting at the very least. By then, he does think he's a merchant prince. She didn't like being 
you know, addressed in rather sort of blunt terms the expression we did. And she really regarded him as a very convenient functionary. Uh, and so he never did get the, uh, the great um, sort of rewards that he expected, expected to get. But his key to getting in there and so you, you get into office, I suppose it's not quite true to say anyone can get into office, but I'm not sure staying there. Is, is what really counts. And he stays there because he, he, he works closely with these people and you know, he, they, they snuggle up together. Uh, and in fact, you know, I mean the word cronyism springs to mind and I use it a little um, you know, a, a number of times and you'll see why when we get a little bit further on in this, in, in this talk. Because really almost from the beginning, uh, uh, um, I mean, Tudor, the wheels of, 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 of the power in, the two reports are greased by mutual benefits, basically by you know, mutual favours. Uh, and it's not long before Cecil's getting Gresham, uh, not just to do government business, but to get in um, 100 German handmade shirts, uh, to get in velvet chairs, his new house at Stanford in, um, in uh, Burley House in, in Stanford in Lincolnshire, to get Spanish leather chairs, to get a clock, uh, to get um, um, slate, slates, um, Roof, expensive paving stone by, sh by the whole shipload, um, wainscoting um, uh, for, for, for the panelling for, for the walls, marble pillars, all of those things. And of course, also, it's rather intriguing to get him a uh, Bologna sausage, ham secured and smoked in Antwerp, wild boar smoked and cured in Antwerp, uh, a wolfskin gown, uh, all this, all this, all, all this, all this, all this sort of thing. And uh, with, with um, Dudley, it's, um, it's a bit easier. You didn't wear clothes like that without borrowing money, uh, especially because he didn't really have any, la any lands other than those that Elizabeth gave him. Uh, and Dudley, pretty much throughout the reign, is in hock to Rob Robert, Robert Dudley. Uh, essentially, um, Russia is one of the people financing uh, Dud Dudley. By the way, anyone who, uh, any, any, um, whoever painted that, um, whoever painted that, uh, probably Master Stephen, but the question is which Stephen, we won't get there now, art historians are still quarrelling about this. Uh, who have painted that and seen the, the, the famous portrait of Charles V um, with his dog, uh, by Titian. Uh, and here we see Gresham at work early in the reign. I mean, he's, this is just in one week. He's, he's, uh, she's borrowed 128,449 pounds from 15 bankers. He's swung, that's a lot of money. I mean, multiply that's at least 128 million, and probably quite a bit more. Uh, the very least is, is to multiply by 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 a thousand. Um, that's also his neatest handwriting. The beginning of the rain, it gets worse as the rain the rain goes on. Economic theory. Well, we've heard about Gresham's law, so we needn't really do too much with that that here. Uh, there is a, quite a famous document called the Memorandum <coughs> of Exchange of 1560. Uh, I can tell you for sure that Gresham, although he's often said to have written this, didn't write it. He couldn't possibly have written it for the very simple reason that whoever wrote this had a rather sort of silly idea that coins could be valued and the value maintained at mid par. Whereas the whole point of Gresham's, I mean, obviously the true value was related to the bimetallic content. The whole point of Gresham's, I mean, the whole centre point of Gresham's philosophy uh, and position was that the exchanges should be free to move up and down. Uh, that they should, they should be, they should be, there should be flexibility in the exchange because, of course, that was how, how money could be, how money could be made and, and debt reduced by, 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 by clever dealing. Uh, but of course, what is interesting about this is that it does incorporate, as does another financial treatise a little bit later, 1564, which Gresham may have contributed. The, the key idea in this that does come from Gresham is how the value of the pound sterling can artificially be supported by turning a mass of the Queen's treasure upon the exchange by Her Highness's factor and making England the lord of the exchange, i.e. the stability or equalisation fund argument uh, again. I, I don't know, you probably, somebody here knows, well, I think they know, um, I don't think that the idea of the stabilisation fund was actually tried here very seriously until after World War I, and it didn't work. But also, um, of course, uh, throughout this and most Tudor financial um, treatises, uh, proposals and so on, uh, after Gresham is, in, is enshrined this rather sort of crucial idea that he has down here, which he first expresses to uh, Mary Tudor's Privy Council in 1553, 
it is a small matter to bring the Queen in death, but the greatest matter will be to bring her out again for the, this exchange room of all things. In politics, he understands that you can't have sovereignty, true sovereignty, you can't have true monarchical power, you can't have the sovereign national state unless you've got your currency sorted and you, you know, I mean, if, it's going to be, if you're going to have a global outflow of capital because, you know, you mismanaged your economy or your coinage, and in this, in this case, you haven't got the sovereignty. And of course, this particularly applies to the small fledgling states like, like England. If you're Philip II, it's, things can be very different. You're just too big. If you're, if you're the Spanish Empire or the Habsburg Empire, you're too big to fail. Uh, you're much too big to fail. Philip II, well, Spain went bankrupt four times in the 16th century. Uh, and what they did was, I think this is what I, it's not in the book, but I think this is what the EU did to Cyprus, is it not? Uh, what Spain did was, it just arbitrarily issued euros, new bonds, for debts which are significantly you know, discounted, and also wrote down the interest rate to a much smaller proportion than it had been earlier. Yeah, yeah. Russian then, this is Russian very much by Anthony Moore. This is, this is Gresham, uh, painted um, uh, around uh, 1563. Uh, uh, Anne Fernley and Gresham is in Antwerp at that time with him. Uh, he's um, he'd been appointed by Elizabeth to be her representative for a while at the court of the regions of the Netherlands, uh, Margaret of Parma. Uh, it's an absolutely splendid um, um, double, double portrait. Uh, this is very much Gresham as the sort of statesman. Notice there's no merchant, there's no merchant's mark. There's no accoutrements of, of, being, of being, being a merchant. Uh, you know, this is very much somebody who um, um, is a man of authority who moved up to that, of course, was one of Anthony Moore's great um, sort of tr um, theatrical trademarks. Remember, he had been the court artist to Philip II. Um, I was absolutely sure of that until I saw those portraits of another merchant. Uh, and his wife, which are actually split between the North Carolina Museum of, of Art in, in Raleigh and the Art Institute of Chicago. And then I realized that rather like Hans Holbein the Younger, um, or a modern photographer, Anthony Smaller had a stage set, it's the same chairs. You know, it's the same chain uh, that's being fingered. It's the same poses. You know, you might, it might even be the same dress, but with different, different, different form. It might even be the same dress and the same sleeves, but painted differently. So that's a bit of a shame, but anyway, there you go. You pays your money, you change your choice. Uh, Gresham had a house in the suburbs, that's not it. But you can see uh, the sort of thing that you would get, uh, and it, because it was in Antwerp that he also learned about the Flemish style of architecture. The arcade, the, the arcade, the colonnade, um, the, the number of stories, the stucco work, the decoration, uh, the, the chimneys with the little sort of um, um, Penance and, 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 and so on. There's a courtyard, the open courtyard at the front. He, he was actually in Antwerp seeing uh, the, what he called the townhouse. The statues have been built up, uh, and it was built by uh, Andre Van Parschen, uh, working with a designer called Ernest <coughs> Flores. And guess what? When he's decided to build the Royal Exchange, he hires these guys. The very same guys. He also hires Flemish builders. In fact, he actually starts a trade union dispute trade dispute in London because there's a big row with the, 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 uh, the London um, Bricklayers Union that has to be sort of basically smooth, smooth, smoothed over. Uh, but that is the result. Uh, that is the most famous and most detailed engraving of what the first Royal Exchange looked like, which was expression offered to the city if the corporation and the nurses company between, well, the corporation to begin with and the nurses chipped in, found the site, cleared it, he would pay for the building. Uh, he would also, also also um, a profit from the shopping mall, uh, but he promised to give it to the corporation and the master's company in perpetuity uh, after his death. In fact, he's found in Russia, he told them to use the money to fund Russian College instead, so they, 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 it was a little bit of a poison chalice, certainly at the beginning. Um, not least because he, he let out all the shops, and his widow did the same on long leases, so it was a long time before anyone in the city or Russian College actually got any money uh, out, of the, out, of, out, of the, out of the shopping mall. Uh, but it's also impressionistic because I know for a fact that although the statues of, of, of earlier monarchs, the gallery of statues of earlier monarchs, uh, is closely depicted in detail there. In fact, the only statue that was finished in, in Elizabeth's lifetime was the one of herself. Uh, I think one of the big tragedies for Gresham uh, 
uh, was that he imagined that this would be called Gresham's Force. That's what it was to be, the boss or Gresham's Force, and it was going to be his coat of arms over the front. Elizabeth wasn't having any of that. Uh, she insisted on coming to open it, not as a favour to uphold to honour Gresham, but to prove that only she was in charge of the voyage and um, financial matters in, 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 in England. That was part of her prerogative. Um, and she came and she did that in person. Um, and in fact, to add insult to injury, the keeper of the exchange and rechange, the man who got effectively the right to sell licenses to all foreign exchange dealers of any nationality in London, and also to effectively charge what he would call stamp duty on the actual um, um, paperwork uh, of these various deals. Of course, our own chief minister, William Cecil, and not Thomas Gresham. Uh, and I think it's for that reason, I think it's for that reason that he founded Gresham College. His son Richard had died in 1563, his only legitimate son, uh, by his wife um, and, and, uh, and, uh, and Gresham. Uh, and um, if one knows, he knew about art, uh, and he knew about architecture. And of course, if you remember the very famous debate uh, at the time of Philip of Macedon as to what was the best way to perpetuate a legacy picture or a monument in stone. Uh, of course, rather like um, Henry VIII, who said, it's not either or, it's both and. Uh, Gresham did the same. He wanted a monument in stone. Uh, and also, that he left us the portraits of, 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 him, of, of himself. Um, but of course, what was revolutionary about Gresham College? I don't think a lot of people have said, oh, it's the subjects, you know, the various subjects that were chosen. I really don't think that. They're not that different to the seven subjects that were being taught about in Cambridge. What's revolutionary about Gresham College, and what really is a legacy, a long and enduring legacy, it is the fact that, that um, you didn't have to matriculate. You could just walk in and out. You didn't have to eat expensive dinners. You didn't have to sign the 39 articles to get, to get as you did at Oxford or, or, or Cambridge. And on the whole, there was a, a, a sort of push towards more practical subjects, although that took a couple of more, more practical ways of delivering lectures on subjects, although, of course, that was quite contested uh, you know, for quite a long time. Well, that's the other portrait of him, about 1567. We don't know the exact date. Those are the famous ones. Of course, there's two different versions. I think that's because he had three big, three, three, when he had three, he had many houses, but he had the three big ones, uh, Gresham House, uh, the exchange, of course, the exchange, the um, Gresham College was, of course, to be to be um, based at Gresham House, which was built uh, from 1563. It was finished about 1566. A lot of people say that that's a few people who have left the same Flemish architects. It couldn't have been because that's, uh, you know, even from that 18th century illustration, it's clearly a relatively traditional tube of brick and timber uh, structure. Uh, uh, but the other two, of course, were Osterley and Mayfield. Osterley just you know, nearly thrown. Uh, and um, uh, Mayfield in, in Sussex. I'll skip over that because of time. I'm afraid that he didn't die or end his career as the richest man in London. Uh, he died, his <coughs> account turned out to be quite heavily in debt. Uh, he, at the end of when he decided to retire, uh, he owed Elizabeth 18, for the first 18,000, over 18,000 pounds. He got it reduced by the debt of work to 10,800. 10, uh, and basically, he was overcharging brokerage fees, he was inflating his expenses and those of his uh, staff and officers. Um, he insisted on charging, he basically insisted on delivering his accounts for audit to Flemish pounds and not sterling to make it more difficult, so he could widen his margins, but also, um, you know, basically to make it much more difficult to unpick. But these guys were thorough. You know, they, they took a year to go through this stuff and they were still chasing up his precious accounts in 1650. Uh, uh, he, um, his last desperate throw of the dice was to try to charge Elizabeth 12% negative interest on her dormant cash balances over the last 10 years with compound interest. Uh, but that didn't naturally, that didn't, uh, that didn't work. He said that it was okay to do that because he'd forborne the use of it. He'd forborne the use of investing or in speculating in her own money, but that didn't go down too well. Um, but largely, in, I mean, the other trick that he had was to, to um, just presume that his Per diems, he got per diems uh, for every day of his service were much higher than they really were, and wait for someone to spot it. So I think we also recognise this sort of uh, this, this sort of thing. Uh, and I'm afraid that when he died in 1579, he still owed 23,000 pounds 
to um, 35 different lenders, that's over 23 million today, and in fact he blighted his widow's life for the next 20 years trying to clear up this mess. This most appalling mess, it's all in the book. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of it, there's a lot of it. Um, uh, and um, I think possibly one of the more disappointing things was that um, those that went down with him were two of his most loyal servants. Uh, Edmund Hogan, who'd been his, one of his most loyal servants, uh, lost um, a, a lot of money uh, in the Gresham crash, uh, as did um, um, another one of his um, um, uh, servants. Uh, and um, you know, in a way, they sort of lost their pensions uh, through through this. But you know, welcome to welcome to Tudor England. I'm afraid um, you could be a fantastic um, government banker. You could be a fantastic um, wizard of labour finance. But um, you know, at the end of the day. Um, Things could perhaps not end up quite so well as you expected. Thank you very much. Well, John, that was magnificent. Uh, now, I know many of you have got lots of questions. Do you know how you can get them answered? <laughs> while you're buying your book. <laughs> um, I say that, we had a bit of time, but John was just going on so well, uh, and so authoritatively, and we do have some uh, catering coming, so I, I thought, I thought I'll, I'll break at that. I know there probably are lots of questions that are good. Um, I would encourage you to just think of a few things before we close. I mean, one is um, John and Richard Gresham, his father and uncle, were, were vile, loathsome people. Um, there's a lecture up at uh, Holt in, uh, in Norfolk, uh, done by the head of history there, which is entitled, believe it or not, John Gresham, Shoveler of Human Manure. Uh, so these were not liked people. The Tudor era was very different. Uh, and I think it's also important, um, you know, we've heard about the Royal Exchange, uh, we've heard about the shopping mall, um, we could go on about his understanding of trimetallism, you know, gold, silver, and copper, uh, and all sorts of good things. But the Royal Exchange is more interesting than you think. Remember that prior to that, merchants who wanted to meet each other could come on up with a venture. This is crazy in these days of networking and first Tuesdays and all that, but they actually used to lock off uh, Cornhill with a chain so you could walk up and down and meet each other. And there were no directories, or there was no internet. You know, how did you meet somebody? I think the three of us will sort of form a kind of a venture, you know? Uh, so it was really quite exciting in its way at that time. Um, but, you know, clearly the, the other thing John's gone on about is the great recoinage. And for those of you who come out of the Stock Exchange or Lloyd's, I hasten to tell you your history of both is wrong. Uh, Jonathan's, we all remember Jonathan's, that was actually when they were thrown out in the late 1700s from the north side of the exchange and they went to a coffee house in my ward, Broad Street. And Lloyd's, obviously Lloyd's started in the coffee shop. It did, but they had actually left the exchange and they thought they'd done a good job. We'll, we'll move down to Tower Street but we won't pay the commission on the exchange, and lo and behold, uh, Lloyd's happened. <laughs> and a couple of years later, he began to charge some commissions. So they were halfway to uh, uh, down towards uh, Tower Bridge. Uh, sorry, to, yeah, well, Tower Bridge today, but down towards the docks in those days. So both of those were there. Um, so Gresham, I mean, amazing, you know, a front runner, a philanderer. Uh, John's book tells you about him being a cuckold as well, which is a, a, interesting to read. And clearly a fiddler of expenses, which uh, uh, none of us would know about, and dies 23 million in debt. So what a character. So I can't do anything other than say, you know, buy a book, buy two, read it. Um, so that's there. There's the exhibition to see. Uh, if you want to hear it all again, uh, John was on this morning on Andrew Marr's Start of the Week with Paul Tucker and others. Uh, so that's on the BBC iPlayer and there to listen to as well. Uh, and then I will uh, again emphasize Peter Ross is there at the back to answer questions about the library. Claire Lachlan Chow is here to answer questions about Gresham College, which uh, has a registrar uh, she knows well. James Pitcher is there to answer questions about the FS Club. And, uh, oh, John Gaudia, yeah. and he's here to answer questions about the book, which is absolutely superb. And I'll just close, remember as you go away tonight, flipping your coin, which is a really good coin if anybody calls on you for formal opening of a cricket match or a football match, something like that. Um, you know, Schumpeter does have it quite well. Schumpeter says quite bluntly, you know, if Gresham's law is so trivially easy to understand, why does everybody get it completely wrong? So let's not get it completely wrong. Let's grab a glass upstairs, see the exhibit, enjoy, enjoy the food and drinks, and buy books. And thank you very much for coming.